welcome back to Coast Connections. I'm your host, Elizabeth Hines, and joining me today, I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming one of our national treasures. We've got Ken Kirkby. He's a philosopher, a conservationist, an activist, and he's a painter of stories. And I discovered him recently, uh, and he lives right here on Vancouver Island. So welcome, Ken. Thank you very much. How nice much. to have Thanks you here. Invite. Yeah. I actually found you in Arabella magazine. Canada's sumptuous uh, national magazine for art and architecture. And there was a 20 page spread of your Arctic um, paintings and it just blew me away. And I read your story and all the way to the end. And then I realized you live in Bowser, yeah. just up the road. <laughs> yeah. And it was such a treat to you know get in touch with you and have you come and share your story with us here. So thank Great. you so much. Happy to. Yeah, but talking about the, the article in Arabella, can you imagine an, a magazine of that stature yes. allowing me, someone like me in exactly. there? Exactly, little old who, you. Who lives in Bowser. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bowser, but you came by a very interesting route. Yeah. Now, how does a fellow who was born in one of the first air raids in London, grew up in Portugal, end up coming to the Canadian Arctic and being one of our preeminent artists, capturing the story of the art? Well, first, the I, three -minute I, version, I, I, Ken. I don't view myself as an artist. That's a heck of a long story. I'm a painter. Mm -hmm. I paint. If I was using pipes and you know, wrenches, I'd be a plumber. Uh, if I'm an artist, it's 250 years from now, we'll find out if I made a difference. There, yeah. And so I'm not going to have the luxury, neither are you. So never mind. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, we just paint. And, but to answer your question, well, my mom and I were kind of busy. Uh, when the air raid was going on, <clears throat> she, of course, having a much more difficult time than me, I just didn't have to do much, just get pushed out. <laughs> but, yeah, there was a bomb that went through the room next door, and it didn't explode. Hmm. And it was one of those bombs that would go straight through the basement, buried itself on the ground, and nothing happened. Hmm. A few minutes later, another bomb went through further down the corridor, straight into the basement, did not explode. Really? So, one can get all full of quandaries about, you know, things like that and get tripped up in a lot of strange ideas. All I can say is that it was an omen. Mm. Thankfully, not an amen. <laughs> so, yeah. An omen, not yeah. an omen. But eventually, long story short, my dad got us out of the cities Every city we went to was the one, next one they hammered. Mm. And so decided we would go live in the country. Eventually, uh, when, when the war came to an end, and we were able to go back to Europe, my mom's, my dad was from England, uh, of a real mix, okay, Danes and, and Irish and, and mm -hmm. Italians. My, my, his mother was an Italian from Genoa and was the heiress to the largest commercial maritime fleet in the world. Yeah. And my granddad was the fellow who, who owned and ran Sheffield Steel, the biggest steel maker in the world. So was, these were not love marriages, let me tell you. These were marriages of money, power, and convenience. Huh. And eventually, my mom's family wanted to go back to Spain. So my dad reluctantly went along with it, but he couldn't stomach the Spaniards, and he hated Franco with a passion. Mm -hmm. He loved Portugal and had been there many times, and so he, he went and started business in Portugal. And I learned a lot, most everything from him, and one other person, and a man I'll get to in a minute. But my dad was a, an odd character of all the oddest of odd characters. He was a saintly figure, not that he would care to have himself viewed that way, I don't think. But he was a capitalist, industrialist, socialist, who had the capacity to make hundreds of millions and billions of dollars and pounds of money. And he gave it away. Mm -hmm. And the more he gave away, the more it came. Mm -hmm. And he had the magic touch with it and people and so on and so on. And because when you're that good, of course, people are going to want to kill you. Mm. So they did. So they tried three times and failed. Mm. And just to end the story, I couldn't figure out why an industrialist of that magnitude would have a taxi cab company in Lisbon with six cabs. It made no sense. After he died, 
and I was his executor, I got all the documents. He was one of the heads of Intrepid, the secret organization out of Bletchley Park in England. And his buddies, were, he had hired them all to run, to pretend they were a, a taxi cab company. And they were able, they were spies underneath everything in Europe. So I lived in this really strange little village in the center of the original Riviera. Mm. Not the Johnny Come Lately French Riviera, mm -hmm. you know, not to be mistaken. Mm. And so there was the wealth of the power of the world was there and poverty all around. And so my dad, he, he tried to change it and he did. And eventually, long story short, and some stories best avoided, uh, before I, I left uh, Portugal, my, we, had to, we got my dad out and it saved his life. The, Portuguese, the Canadian ambassador to Portugal played a huge role mm -hmm. and arranged for us to disappear. And through Diefenbaker and his Minister of, of Immigration. So we came here as half assed, pardon the phrase, refugees, immigrants. Still not sure which of them I am. Both, probably. <laughs> and anyway, <clears throat> but on the way to, all the way through this was a man by the name of Francisco. Yes. And for all the brilliant people my dad knew, he was the most intelligent man, soul I've ever encountered. He told me stories about Canada. He'd been a whaler when he was a young, young man mm -hmm. in the Baffin Island. And then cod fishing on the Grand Banks with the Basques mm -hmm. and, and the Portuguese. And he was the man who taught me how to think, how to see the world radically differently. And yeah, the, I, it's almost impossible to describe a human who accomplished so much inside of the soul of another. Mm. And so those stories were the things that got me on fire. And when the time came to run away, because that's what we did, save our necks, um, Canada was the place. Mm -hmm. And so I told the family, if you, I don't know where you're going, I know where I'm going. You yeah. wanna follow me? Get on my bus. There you go. So we came to Canada. And we're glad you did, yeah. So far. Yeah, so far, yeah. <laughs> now Ken, you've been um, painting stories for, you said 70 years. And the stories we want to talk about today are the stories that you painted in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to uh, know what you're like inside, Ken. What does art mean to you? Well, art, oh boy, what a story that is. Great question. <laughs> art to me is not a pretty painting, a beautiful painting, great sculpture, uh, all of the arts areas. No, it's did your work affect your kin and your kind. Mm. One hopes in a way to the better. Did it change your world and those around you? Mm -hmm. And if it did, you made art. Mm. Otherwise you made very fine looking things. Mm. And we will never know. Yeah. You won't know, no one in this room will know, no one in the audience will know. Yeah. There is no luxury of knowing. And it's not our job to know. Our job is to attempt every day to make art, mm -hmm. change the world for the way, uh, what you see as the better. Mm -hmm. Then the chances are much higher. You may, not, you may not write a book, you may not write a song, you may not paint a painting. You may find some other way, some way we haven't found yet, and we need, we, we need, that. We need that. Because when you look around at the tragedies that are going on in the world, God, do we need a change. Mm -hmm. And so, if you can accomplish that in a lifetime, the, it, it sounds impossible, which would be to abandon hope. For me, the only thing that turns my crank and turns me up on 11 out of 10 is if it's impossible, mm -hmm. I'm interested. <laughs> Otherwise, not so much. Don't sign me up. Yeah. yeah. I've been called arrogant and a lot of ugly things for it. You know what? <laughs> Hell with them. <laughs> yeah. I like that attitude. So, Ken, let's go north. Let's go to the Arctic where not many Canadians have been, at least, um, you know, Caucasian Canadians. 
Um, and throughout the show, we're going to be showing some pictures of your artwork, but I want to give the viewers a sense of the sensory experience that you had up there. Mm -hmm. So describe to me um, what it's like to breathe in those really sub-zero temperatures, minus 30, minus 40. What's it like to be outside and to actually breathe in that, in that environment? Well, for someone, it's probably different for different uh, people. The, the Inuit who are born to it, <clears throat> who, who know that experience throughout eons, yes. <clears throat> it's one thing. They uh, know how to behave in it. Mm -hmm. When we go there, <clears throat> we don't. No. So if you try and exert yourself at, at 35 to 50 below zero, it will kill you. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is if you, 50 below zero, Will, will scorch your insides as much as fire will. Wow. Don't forget, heat and cold are just extremes. But the, ultimately, the end, of, the, end, the end result is the same. Yeah. So you respect it. You see, here, we, we for instance, today, all, all year, I go around dressed more or less in the same clothing. Mm -hmm. And we can be, you know, freezing, but we go out in the same clothes. Mm -hmm. Most of us do. We don't pay much respect or attention to what's going on in the weather, in this, at least in this sliver of Canada, yeah. right on the edge. Um, we go that way a little bit and maybe different. But what it's like, for instance, in, in, in that book, North, when you open it up, the, t the, two, the 24 inches of spread is what the tundra looks like. And I can give you, tell you a brief story of, the first time I encountered this, I'm now clothed in the clothing of the Inuit. Mm -hmm. I went there, I had a thin little sleep bag. I mean, talk about, you're never going to live here, man. No. I was told, you're just another desperate Englishman looking for desolate yeah. places. And I just want to let our viewers know that you lived with the Inuit for five years mm -hmm. in the 1960s, so you got to know them very intimately. Yeah. You had huge respect for their culture. Um, you had a you describe it as going into a time machine um, when you were living up in the Arctic. And um, I want you to describe for us, if you can, what is the Inuit spirit like? What was that like to be amongst those people who were living so close to the land? A few key words about what their spirit, the Inuit spirit is. Well, after a while, quite a while, there was a grandmother who just watched me and had questions asked me because I couldn't speak her language and she couldn't speak my languages. Mm -hmm. And her, one of her grandchildren had escaped residential school. Mm -hmm. And he'd come and he could speak English so we could converse with each other. And once they were sure that I didn't work for the government, yes. for the church, or for any institution, which they thought, was, they'd never met one. Mm. And it was quiet. It was a quiet kabluna. Kabluna, in their language, is the singular. And kablunat is the plural of us white people. What it means in their language is eyebrows on belly button. We are noisy, <laughs> ridiculous, <laughs> intrusive, rude people. You never shut up. And I'm the proof of it. And <laughs> so once I learned to be quiet, 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 mm -hmm. and never speak unless spoken to, and don't do anything, don't look at their eyes. It's, it's very rude, mm -hmm. okay? So once I'd gotten the learning, be, the beginning understanding, just be, be very quiet, be modest, be, wait, for, wait for things to happen. They don't tell you what to do. They never tell you what to do. Mm. At best, the children are told cautionary tales. So there, once we got past that, then it was a whole different story. Mm -hmm. Then the grandma took me under her wing and commanded the rest of my life there over the five years. What did and, she tell you about the Northern Lights, Ken? Well, one day when we were outside, and uh, when I, before I left Portugal and then after coming to Canada and then the North in a very short period of time, I suffered two deep personal tragedies. Mm -hmm. In both cases, the women that I loved dearly died, one of um, uh, ruptured appendix and the other one in a, uh, in a truck car accident. Yeah. And so I wasn't in very good shape. And when I went there, she sensed what was wrong. And eventually, she, when we were standing outside of an igloo on a very clear crystal night, and the night that Aurora, the Northern Lights, are moving like 
crazy, beautiful. There are no words for it. And she put her arm through mine. And she said, because they don't use I or me or mine. They don't have words like that. They don't possess anything or anyone. She said, those are your ancestors. They're dancing for you. But if you're too sad and you don't let go of those, those things that hurt you, they will stop dancing for you. You had to let them free. You must not possess even that. Beautiful. And a little after that, we, she would told a story by drumming. Mm -hmm. And she said, what we need is Nunavut and we need Usumatak. And so she explained it all. And the word Nunavut is our land. Mm -hmm. Not that we won't be Canadians, that we won't be passionate Canadians, but that we will join you on an equal basis. We are not your welfare cases. Yeah. We are proud and capable people. We have lived here for eons yeah. and we've survived. We've even survived you yes. and yes. your people. Yeah. So she then got me to see all that she wanted me to see and to see the things even that are forbidden mm -hmm. and that I was immune from being uh, the taboos would not affect me mm -hmm. she you, and when it was when when I she said if you're not going to stay with us and marry and be part of us you are you are now Enoch and I said the color of this tells me I'm not she said you're wrong that is not how it is your spirit is mm -hmm. you're Enoch inside and that's good enough yeah and so go out in the world and tell them what you've seen. I said, well, look, I am a green-eyed white man who paints <laughs> paintings and draws drawings. I'm not important. She said, never mind, just go out and do it. So I spent the next 31 years and many fortunes, two wives and a lot of friends, <laughs> and 19.6 uh, million bucks, <laughs> and walked into our parliament, unveiled the painting, which is illegal to do these things, but the speaker, the then speaker of the house was a dear drinking buddy and a fishing buddy. This is buddy. the Canadian Parliament. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I presented to the Canadian Parliament. And uh, by the time I was done, they were weeping. And it was a high emotional moment, a set of moments. Ken, let's hold that up. Now, this is, um, this is, tell us the name, of the Inuit name of this. The Inuit name for this is Isumatak. Mm -hmm. And isumatak means an object or a person in whose presence wisdom might show itself. That's one word. Hmm. They don't need many words. No. And it is 12 feet high, yep. this way, and 152 feet long. 152 feet. Um, yeah. An NHL rink is about 200 feet. Yeah. So this is now, it's interesting a, you bring three quarters that up. You of see, its size. Back in the day of Michelangelo, uh, people, pretty much everybody went to church. In our time, not so much. Where do people in Canada go? What's the Canadian church? Tim Hortons. Hockey arena. <laughs> oh, that, that too. Hockey is our church. <laughs> yeah. And so I designed this painting to go into arenas across mm. the country. Mm. Come, to, come to the church and see what I've done. Mm. Come and see what your brethren up there live in. Mm, beautiful. And so this came to be. Yeah. And so it took many, many years to do. It took about 12 years to do, right? Well, the, the painting itself yeah. took 12 years. Yeah. The actual project took 31 years. Wow, Ken. Yeah. What a labor of love. Yeah. And let's talk about the Anukshuk and the Anukshui. Yeah, Anukshui. Uh, Anukshui. Oh. So the Anukshuk, uh, which features very prominently in a lot of your art, um, means language of the land, I think. Um, there's on the cover of the book. Yeah. By the way, let me just put a plug in for this book. Yeah. This is an astonishing piece of literature written by Godini Osi. It's mm -hmm. the story of your life. Mm -hmm. It should be a, a blockbuster Hollywood film, but I know that you would never want that. No. <laughs> and uh, Godini Osi is a Nanaimo author, and she's yeah. done an incredible job capturing this story. It's uh, a true Canadian adventure. It's, it's very riveting. So just want to make well, sure. She is by far the best. There, there have been a whole yeah. bunch of books and publications and mm -hmm. endless articles and stuff. And she is the best. Well, she did a fantastic job. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the Anukshuks and what that means and how they're used in the north. What I was surprised to learn was some of these Anukshuk, Anukshui, um, 
uh, the boulders weigh tons. Mm -hmm. They're tons. How they ever formed these, it's like the Egyptian pyramids. It's a mystery. It is a mystery. Up, uh, <clears throat> if the further north you go, when you get to King William Island, which is way the heck and gone mm -hmm. up there, there's rows of Inukshuks, Inukshuit there, that are huge. They're, 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 uh, they're not like the one with the arms and, and so that we're yeah. familiar with. There are many, many shapes for them. But they have giant boulders lifted up and stones placed under them so they, they look quite different. Mm -hmm. The weight of those things is massive. Mm. Nobody's figured out how the heck they no. did it. I love it. Yeah. And obviously, you see, they didn't have rope the way we have it. Mm -hmm. They did have walrus hide rope, very mm -hmm. strong. But there isn't that much snow up there. Mm. Yeah, so you couldn't build ice and ice and have a ramp to slide. I, can't, I don't know how the heck they did it. Mm. But the people, when I, when I, everywhere I've asked who made these, everybody would say the Tunit. Mm -hmm. The Tunit made them. The Tunit are an earlier people than the Inuit, or the, what we used to know as Eskimos, which right. they regard as <clears throat> uh, a slight. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a good word. And the Tunit were giants with children's minds. Mm -hmm. So apart from, instead of saying no or yes, or they don't, they give an explanation that is sweet, innocuous, mm -hmm. and go figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, it's, um, today is the, actually the International Day of the Polar Bear. Um, so it's it, it, uh, interesting that we're interviewing you on this day. So what was the closest encounter you had with a polar bear? Were you ever close enough to actually smell one? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, it's a, it's a quite good story. Um, I'd heard how they hunted them in the old days before mm -hmm. rifles. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I wanted to experience that. And the head hunter in this particular group didn't like me. Didn't want anything to do with me. But the grandmother just raised her eyebrows. Mm -hmm. And we got, there, you see, you don't say yes, you don't say no, there's no talk. You just... If you're in agreement with something, <clears throat> you just raise your eyebrows slightly. Mm. And if you don't care for it, you, w you flare your nostrils. Mm. That's it. <laughs> anyway, she put pay to it and made sure that I went with this man who hated me. And so off we went in the, in the old way. And you spread your sense. So you are the hunter, <clears throat> but you are the hunted. Mm. And so <clears throat> polar bears have tremendous smell, poor eyesight. And they are huge. A big male is 13 feet tall when he stands up. Wow. <clears throat> now, average ceiling in a house is eight feet. He's got all those feet to go yet. Yeah. They're huge. Massive. So anyway, how they did it was at the edge of the ocean with, with the tides going up and down, up and down, up and down, busting the ice. And then the powerful winds and currents pile it all up against the shore. Hmm. And it can be 50, 60, 80 feet high. And in places, there are crevices where you can get in. And so you get in there with your back up against it, <clears throat> and you have a long spear. And that bear, when it charges you, your job is to direct the spear into it, and its energy impales it and kills it. Wow. But that, now that shaft is just going crazy. Yeah. This is not a pretty business. No. Um, death, and I've seen a whole bunch of it, whether in war and revolution and other kinds of uh, unfortunate incidents. This is in a blue-white world and a golden world. Mm. When that much blood is spilled on, on it, it, it really does something mm. to you. Mm. Anyway, we did it. Mm -hmm. And essentially in his language, he said, you don't have the cojones for it. Oh. Huh. And I said, I'm prepared to die for it. Is that enough? Mm. So anyway, on the International Day of the Polar Bear, <clears throat> On that day, I and he killed a polar bear, mm -hmm. but we did it in the old bullfighting fashion, mano a mano. Mm -hmm. There were no horses, there were no, you, no, no, no rifles, and it was in a way, if there is an honest way of killing, it was an honest way of killing. Mm -hmm. I, I've never killed another animal. Mm. 
And I also like how the Inuit honor the animals that they need to eat mm -hmm. to survive. And in death, in the, um, your, your story, um, they'll take the body out onto the tundra in a circle of rocks mm -hmm. and, you know, reverently place it there mm -hmm. and then turn and walk away and it's left for the animals. Yeah, they take what gift they back. can, mm -hmm. and yeah, and the rest is for everybody. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and but mostly because there's frozen, the tundra can be a thousand or more feet thick yeah. of ice. Yeah. It's permafrost, so there's no burying anybody there. Mm -hmm. Now we have backhoes, and exactly. we have to do all Different. this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I still don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> they build these stone circles for many, many reasons. One is to hold tents down yeah. in the very strong winds. Another one is to bury the dead in their clothed, in their best clothes. In some cases, not everybody's the same. They do things differently in different places. And they have, Inuktitut is a language of dialects. It varies quite a bit. But quite often you'll see possessions in the edge of the stones. And that is somebody has been buried there and the animals will come and eat them. And I find that's a, an appropriate way. Yeah. I've eaten animals, animals should eat me. Here I feel go. sorry for them because I'm a toxic waste dump. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, we're running out of time here, okay. but I just want to encourage viewers to pick up the book, uh, The Story of Your Life. It's just absolutely fascinating. It's also a story of Canada. And to pick up the Arabella magazine to get your 20-page um, spread, your artwork is absolutely breathtaking. It just makes my soul want to breathe and, um, oh, thank you. and be silent. And there's so much beauty in silence. And I want to leave you with a quote that your, both your grandparents gave you when you were a child before you came to Canada. And I thought it was so beautiful. May life be kind to you and open many doors. So I just want to say may life continue to be kind to you and continue to open many doors like you've opened the door to the Arctic for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. It's Thank been a pleasure. You. Thank you for joining us here on Coast Connections. We look forward to seeing you again on a future episode.